Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. Our first lesson comes from the Exodus in chapter 13. This is a point where the people have uh, initially left uh, the land of Egypt, are leaving the land of Egypt. This is before the big Red Sea episode. Listen now to the Word of God. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God thought if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt prepared for battle. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. And neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, the New Testament reading comes from the book of Galatians, the beginning of that book in which Paul the Apostle describes his own conversion experience. In the book of Acts, there are three separate accounts where Paul's conversion is described. And In Galatians, it is told in his own words as opposed to having someone else tell it. So let us listen that we may hear what the Lord is saying to us. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son to me so that I might proclaim Him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you, before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and I was still unknown by the sight by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. The word of the Lord. There's an old story that comes from New England of some travelers who are in the, in an area that's fairly isolated, and they're trying to make their way from where they are to where they want to go. And they begin to consider this, and finally they ask for directions. And as they ask for directions, 
the local whom they ask thinks for a minute, and then he responds by saying, you can't get there from here. You can't get there from here. Maybe you have been in a place where it seems like you cannot get there from where you are. We know that the shortest route, the shortest route between two places, the shortest distance between uh, any two points is a straight line. But sometimes when we get down to the actual journey, the line is not straight. And in fact, we end up going in a rather circuitous route or maybe a roundabout way. At the beginning of Exodus, as the children of Israel were leaving the land of Egypt, the Lord laid before them a roundabout way. The Lord said, they may get tested, they may get concerned, and they may run into trouble if they encounter these people right up the road. So let's have them go in another way where they won't encounter the Philistines and the people that might cause them trouble, but send them out so they can prepare for this longer journey. We know that to go from point A to point B in a direct line is the straightest way, it's the most efficient way, and theoretically at least, it is the least um, time-consuming way. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you have ever taken a shortcut that turned out not to be so short after all? Yeah, you got it. But when we go on a roundabout way, when we go sort of a different path, there are some things that are different. We see things that might, we wouldn't have seen otherwise. There are different vistas that are in front of us. And by definition, it probably will take a little extra time. But sometimes, sometimes that time is what we need. That time is useful along the way. That is what I think the children of Israel found out. They found it out that they needed some time to get ready for those threats that would come their way. So they were led on this roundabout way. There are times when we face challenges and we face threats. And to avoid them, we must not go the direct path, but we find that we end up going on that roundabout way. It requires preparation to make any journey. It requires effort and diligence. And we find it as we travel around. The state of Georgia designates certain roads they call scenic byways. In other words, roundabout ways. And by definition, a scenic byway is any designated highway, street, road, or route which significantly features certain intrinsic qualities that should be protected or enhanced. The intrinsic qualities are the resources present along the byway that define its character, interest, and appeal. There are six types of intrinsic qualities. Scenic, historic, natural, cultural, archeological, and recreational. For this designation to fit, you have to be able to fit into one or more of those categories. They must relate, again, the definition words, they must relate or contribute to the distinctive character of the region. In other words, the State Highway Department wants to identify, develop, and promote these byways, these roundabout ways, to enhance the life of that region and extend that to enhance the life of the state. They are promoting going on a roundabout way, if you will. When you look at the list of roundabout ways, you will see that one scenic byway is called I-185. Imagine that. The most direct way 
to get from Columbus to North Georgia and vice versa is to go on a roundabout way, to go on a scenic byway. Sometimes those byways, those roundabout ways, do in fact become the direct ways that we need to travel. There is, tr this is true not simply for the roads we take, but I think it is also true for individuals. It is true for churches. It is true for organizations. Consider Paul. He was brought, brought up in accordance with what was taught to be right, and he was trying to do it to the best of his ability. He was devoted and determined to follow the law of God as he understood it. But according to his own testimony in Galatians, he encountered something very powerful that completely upended his preparation. And he went on a roundabout way. He went off into Arabia, he says, and then he returned to Damascus for three years, sitting and learning and growing in his faith and his ability to speak of his faith. Just what had happened to this God that he understood would not change, and yet now he understood God had sent Jesus, and that changed everything for him. Churches travel in roundabout ways as well as people. We may find that the route we thought we would take is not where we end up being. This is especially true, I think, for a church during a transitional time of pastoral leadership, an interim time as we are experiencing here at First Presbyterian. The work of calling the next installed pastor is being done. And sometimes you say, well, can it be any shorter? Can't we get there any sooner? And it seems like we're on a roundabout way. But I would suggest to you that there are some advantages in this path we are choosing or we are going on. One of the things the church continues to do throughout is the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. But what does that look like now as opposed to 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 100 years ago? What does the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ consist of? The mission field of Columbus has changed not just in the last year or two, but for the last, over the last 50 years, it's changed. Things that were the way they were then are not necessarily the way they are now. Yet, we are still here. We are still on the corner of First Avenue and 11th Street. We are still doing the mission and ministry of God. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with all the changes that have come on around us? Uptown Columbus is undergoing a renaissance, some would say. For many years, it has been a financial and a legal center. It's the, uh, where the courthouse is and where so much of uh, business is done. But in more recent years, it is also becoming a center for arts and a center for the university. And as it does so, things change. You may notice there are restaurants that are open after 5 p.m., right? But it's more than that. There's, it's more than simply there are things to do. There are more people here. There are more things to do. In addition to uh, students and faculty and tourists who all come here, we also have a significant population of brothers and sisters who are homeless and who do not have a place to live in a shelter that we think of. One of the things that we do in the church is we, try, we reach out to them. We offer sack lunches. We participate in the food bank. We try to cooperate with other efforts to find ways of ministering to those who are without. Yet I wonder, I wonder, as wonderful as these efforts are, I wonder if there is another way that we can partner with other ministry 
efforts in the city, the churches and the organizations and the business community and the nonprofit world, if we can partner with them to find an end game so that not simply do we feed people, but people find homes so they are no longer homeless. That is one of the challenges that is before us. That is one of the things that comes our way. And it is a wonderful opportunity to be able to have that. That is part of the way in which we are going. And in this, in this roundabout time that we're in, maybe we can find time and energy and effort to address that part of our journey and our calling. A second challenge that comes to us, I think is highlighted by who comes to, to town, who comes to Columbus by their calling, by their service. During World War II and for many years thereafter, Fort Benning transformed Columbus. Soldiers came here for training or for, uh, to be part of, of, of military units. And one of the things this church did was it opened itself up to those soldiers. It provided them places for in, uh, involvement. And a lot of things happened. Some of those soldiers came and they decided to stay. Some of those soldiers came and found brides in this city and found brides in this church. And, and there are any number of you who are here today because of that. You opened yourself up, the congregation opened itself up to these soldiers and something changed. And you were changed because of their presence here. Similarly, we have, because of the opening of the university and other things that are going on in the region right around us, in the, in the few square blocks around us, people are coming to Columbus to live and to study and to stay for some time. What opportunity this presents, what challenge this presents, what way of service this is. I think that by opening ourselves up to all of the communities around us, we will find ourselves in ways of answering God's call of service. It will be different than it was before reaching out to and, and offering ministry and, and hospitality to, um, to people in the 21st century is different than it was during the 1940s. Things will be different, but I am convinced that you as a congregation have the capacity to do that. You have the capacity to adapt, even though you may not give yourself credit for it. You have the capacity to listen to and to respond to the needs that are in the world around us. Being on this roundabout way at this moment allows us to take our breath and to see the terrain that is before us. We may discover, no, I really believe we will, we will discover that this is a time that leads us directly to the place of mission and service that Jesus Christ wants us to be in in the 21st century. And for that, we give thanks to God. Amen. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for the ways in which you call us in different times and places. We ask that you accompany us on this roundabout journey that we're on so that we may be provided with your confidence and your joy and with the ability to see through the eyes you give us, the opportunities for responding to ministry and service. We pray in Christ's name, amen. It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.